And uh, why don't you grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Revelation. And that's page 1102 in the Pew Bibles, Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to read all of chapter 20. Uh, This is something kids can do as well. As you're getting your sheets prepared, you might want to grab a Bible too uh, as a way of thinking through some of the stuff we'll learn today. But we're going to read Revelation chapter 20, page 1102. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years were completed. After that, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and people seated on them who were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they'll reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name has not been found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, In the next six months, uh, our family is going to have the great delight of attending two weddings. Uh, I'm really excited about these weddings for family members because we all love those kind of events, don't we? Uh, We just heard about that as Jess sat with the kids, catching up with those close to us seeing people we haven't seen for a long time, enjoying the spectacle of a wedding service and the prospect of a marriage, and then there's the tucker. We get the privilege of doing it because of the people that we know, a particular person, and such moments, such feasts, such celebrations mark a change in time and life. That's what humans have done right throughout history, isn't it? Uh, We've enjoyed gathering together, we've enjoyed feasts, we've enjoyed great moments of community around food and community interaction across history. So it's no surprise that at the end of Revelation, God turns to feasts in order to give a clarifying word to John and the faithful witnesses, God turns to images we all understand. There are two feasts. All humans will attend, and where you feast will depend on who you know. Where you feast will depend on who you know. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, It's great that it's clear. It's quite vivid, Father, Uh, and some of the imagery in today's passage is quite confronting. Uh, Father, please help us to understand it. Help us not to be distracted but help us to see the clarity you lay before us uh, about you, your work, and your plans. Father, thanks for Jesus, and thank you that we meet him today in a remarkable way. Help us to know him better. Amen. Uh, Again, you'll be uh, reminded that revelation literally means uh, a clarifying word. 
That's what the word apocalypse means. This is a clarifying and clear word from God to John about Jesus so God's mob can be a faithful witness to Jesus. Uh, God has shown John what was, what is, and what will be, and we get to see all of reality from a God perspective. It reassures God's people. God and his son, the lamb that was slaughtered, are in complete control, and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has beaten sin, death, and the devil. Such a clarifying vision strengthens God's people to be a faithful witness to the faithful witness in a world deceived by the lies of the devil. Such a clarifying word helps God's people to understand the devil has been beaten. And what we experience now are his death spasms as he lashes out. It warns God's people. The devil is still dangerous and to be a faithful witness is to follow in the footsteps of the slaughtered lamb wherever he goes. It equips God's people. God's people know now how to deal with the world they live in, having a certainty about the future and it gives them that certainty. The devil is beaten, Jesus will return, Babylon has fallen, God's mob is safe. And as God has provided that clarifying word, the imagery has been pretty vibrant, hasn't it? It's been pretty colourful, there's intensity, and as those overhead projector sheets pile up on each other, we go deeper and deeper into the divine truth behind the concrete world we see. And every time we come to those images, we're meant to understand them in terms of their quality, not in terms of their quantity. We've come to the end of this revelation Uh, Stephen gets the great privilege next week of painting the marvellous future. Uh, It's just just terrific. Uh, As we come to the end, we've finished what will be and we've looked at the same period of time from different angles, those cycles of seven. We've seen a focus right at the end of that and we've seen that Babylon has fallen. Remember Babylon? The empire of human endeavour set against God. All the institutions out there and all the hearts in here. Babylon has been seen, understood, demolished, and we've run out of it. That's what we looked at last week. Now there's a great celebration, a great celebration in the heavens amongst God's people, and those voices keep flowing. Look at chapter 19, verse 6. I'm at point two on the outline. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters, like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, these words of God are true. What a contrast to Babylon. Remember Babylon? What a replacement. Babylon, dressed in scarlet, surrounded by the stench of evil. The bride of Christ, dressed in white, surrounded by the scent of righteous acts. Babylon offers a cup filled with the blood of the saints and sexual immorality. The bride of Christ offers a joyous wedding feast. Babylon, all alone. The bride of Christ, surrounded by a multitude no one can count. What a contrast. What a replacement. And this bride of Christ and the guests at the wedding The guests at the wedding that God has invited, who are they? Well, they're one and the same, aren't they? The bride and the guests. It's all of the people of God. Remember they were described back in Revelation 2 to 3 as the victors? Well, now we've seen what they receive for being a faithful witness, for persevering in proclaiming, look at Jesus. They're gathered, they're invited because God himself has prepared them. Did you see that in verse 8? 
It's almost as if God has got this great big bridal shop and there's one gown and he says, come in and I'm going to dress you. And do you see what he gives them? He gives them righteous acts. God himself has sewn the dress. God himself has put together the outfit. God has gathered the linen and he has dressed his mob in righteous acts and those righteous acts are the acts of Jesus. His perfect life, his perfect death, his perfect resurrection, they are dressed in those and then they live their lives in that outfit daily saying, look at who Jesus is as we follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And those people, how are they described? They're described as blessed. Literally, God has approved them because he has dressed them in the outfit prepared by Jesus. John's just gobsmacked. And as he looks at this feast being established and enjoyed, as he sees the guests approved by God, as he hears the praise of the heavenly mob, what does he do? Well, he bows down to the angel and he worships the angel. And what does the angel do? Well, did you see what the angel does there in verse 10? Then I fell at his feet to worship him. He said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John is watching this magnificent moment of a faithful witness where all of these people have persevered in giving God what he deserves in worshipping the Lamb. And then what does John do? He worships the angel. You see, it's a moment of warning for us, isn't it? Even John can slip. (laughs) Even John can misunderstand the faithful witness. And for God's readers and God's people right throughout the ages, it's a salient warning just in a little verse saying, hey, persevere in the faithful witness and give devotion to God and God alone. Don't get distracted. Don't give good things what God deserves. Not even angels deserve worship. Only God. And in that magnificent scene, point three on the outline, we suddenly see a figure we recognise. All of heaven is opened up there in verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened and there was a white horse. We know this figure But even as we know this figure, even as we remember what God has said back in Revelation chapter 1, the image that we are given here is overwhelming. And it's meant to be. It's almost like those cascading voices in heaven just overwhelm us with descriptions of this person on the horse. And we are meant to be overwhelmed. I just glance through those verses from verses 11 to 16. He's called faithful and true, and we're meant to remember the witness of Jesus. He judges and makes war, all in line with God's truth, and we're meant to remember who defeated the devil. His eyes are fiery and he wears numerous crowns. His name is unknown and we're meant to remember the Son of Man figure in Revelation 1. He wears a robe stained in blood and we remember the slaughtered lamb and the winepress of God's wrath together. He's named as the Word of God and we remember John's biography of Jesus and all the words of Revelation 12 verse 11. He leads the heavenly army and we remember the angels who defeated Satan and the faithful witness of God's people on earth. His mouth opens and a sharp sword comes out. It strikes the nations, rules the nations. We remember Jesus who brings judgment and Psalm 2, the coronation poem. He has the job of trampling the winepress of God's judgment and we remember the coronation in the throne room of God as that slaughtered lamb walked in. He has a name on his robe. It drapes over his leg as he rides into war and we remember the lamb the only one worthy enough to open the scroll in the hand of God and what the angels proclaimed at his coming in Revelation 5. There is no one like Jesus, you see, and we should be overwhelmed. There is nothing meek and mild here, is there? There is everything magnificent and awesome. 
And Jesus rides on to the stage of history and it's his second coming and he is central. And that's why he appears between two feasts. Did you notice that? Jesus is the fulcrum. Jesus is the hinge. Jesus is the person who is central to two meals. And there is another meal. Just look there at verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. He called out in a loud voice, saying to all the birds flying high overhead, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of military commanders, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and of their riders, the flesh of everyone, both free and slave, small and great. When Jesus returns, when Babylon has fallen, there is another meal set, and it's a meal of corpses and carrion. It's a meal of corpses and carrion. It's a meal of the dead. The meal of those who chose to oppose the lamb. They line up the allies of Babylon, don't they? Did you see that in the reading that Shanae brought? Those allies of Babylon prepare to wage war, everyone who rejected God. They know nothing else. They refuse anything else. This is all that they know. But when we read about the war, what is it? Well, it's a rout, isn't it? Before they even draw a sword, the beasts are banished, the allies are killed, the enemies of the Lamb are conquered, as we've been told time and time again. The blood of the Lamb and the testimony of God's mob wipe out the beast. They bring Babylon down and they destroy those who've been deceived. It's not a new victory, is it? We've seen it a number of times. We've seen it from different angles. It's not a new war. There's only one rebellion and there's only one defeat. And again, we see its culmination from another perspective, its complete nature when Jesus returns. And when he does, there's another feast laid. And it's a feast of corpses. Now, before we go on, it's worth pausing at this point and making a few observations. As Babylon falls... And as Jesus returns, two great feasts are set. One is the delight of the wedding banquet of the Lamb and his bride. Jesus and his mob joined together forever. Uh, If you like, it's the culmination of God's search for a bride for his boy. And God has done everything. Uh, There's another feast at the very same moment. And that's the feast of the devastation of the corpses of God's enemies being devoured. And at the heart of both meals and who is on the guest list is Jesus. That's why the image of him is between them. Who he is, what he's done, how people have responded to him. Those who've received him as he truly is who acknowledge him as the slaughtered lamb who lived, died and rose for the sins of his people. Those people who come to him in repentance and dependence, throwing themselves upon the mercy of the slaughtered lamb. Those people who are forgiven and restored to God. Those people who follow the lamb wherever he goes, giving him what he deserves, who are dressed in his righteous deeds, They'll be seated at that wedding banquet. They are the bride. Those who reject him, those who turn good things into God things, those who are deceived by the lies of Babylon and devoted to being God themselves, they are the carrion of the second feast. A commentator this week suggested that the two questions posed before God's mob at this moment are these. Have you met Jesus? This Jesus. Have you met Jesus? And secondly, will you be an eater or will you be eaten? Will you be an eater or will you be eaten? They're confronting questions, aren't they? They expose so much about our lives and so much of what we're preparing ourselves for. 
They ask us tough questions and they're a spur, aren't they? Because there are so many we want at that first feast with us. They're a spur to a faithful witness, not for our sake, but for the sake of those who we want to have meet Jesus and join with us at that first feast. Babylon has fallen. Jesus has returned. Two meals are set. And then we hit this really strange section in chapter 20, don't we? I'm at point five on the outline. Uh, This next section, verses 1 to 10, uh, fills me with a great level of trepidation. (laughs) It's a part of God's word uh, that has caused an immense amount of attention. Uh, The verses that we're about to deal with have caused debate and division, uh, disagreement and discord. They've helped create vast theological structures established on 10 verses. Uh, They're verses that have helped create chronologies, timelines, expectations, even novels and films. But in many ways, I think these few verses have been used by many to be distracted from the clarity we've just seen. And so I want to encourage us to understand these verses very carefully. In that sense, I'm actually going to deal with them quite briefly. Uh, But out of these verses, which mention a 1,000-year period, there has emerged a fascination amongst many people with the millennium, the 1,000 years, and what it means about the end times and the reign of Jesus. Uh, Out of these verses, you have a view called premillennialism, which declares that Jesus will return, rule for 1,000 years with his mob. At the end of that, Satan will escape. There'll be a great war and Jesus will finally win. Now, these same verses, you receive a view called post-millennialism, which proclaims that Jesus' mob will defeat the devil, they will bind him, God's mob will rule the world for 1,000 years. At the end of that time, the devil will escape, Jesus will return, and the devil will be defeated. Both of these are very significant views amongst God's people across the ages. We need to recognise that truth. And let me be blunt. Your view on these two views is not the decider of whether you are at this meal or this meal. It's whether you know Jesus. But as we deal with these views, we need to actually be aware of three truths that help us make sense of them. Uh, First, God's word is very clear time and time again. Across the whole of the Bible, how many rebellions are there against God? There is one. How many victories does Jesus win? He wins one. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 1 Peter 3.18 There is not a systematic rolling great war in which Jesus has to come back time and time again to defeat the devil. There is one rebellion, there is one defeat, and it is at the cross of Christ. Second, the nature of Revelation as apocalyptic is not about chronology or quantity, is it? It's about a God-clarifying view of the world. So 1,000 years here is not about 1,000 years. It's an image to talk about a really long period of time. Because if we are going to say that this is literally 1,000 years, then there really are only 144,000 in heaven. And we need to be consistent, don't we? And so Revelation uses imagery like this time and time again to talk about qualities, not quantities. And thirdly, as you read chapter 20, verses 1 to 10, you see time and time again a whole lot of threads that have been talked about already in Revelation. The devil is defeated. The devil is limited. The devil lashes out even as he's lost. God's people suffer even when the beaten devil rebels against God. It all ends when the defeated devil is thrown out into the depths of eternal judgment. So once we've seen this feast, and once we've seen this feast, and once we've seen who's central, what God gives us in these verses is a snap recap. Let me just summarise everything you've seen in 10 verses. 
before I gather you all to come before my throne. And so when we look through these verses, we see the devil has been beaten already once, completely, by whose blood? The blood of the lamb and the testimony of God's mob. Uh, The devil's already bound. He's thrown out and he's limited. What is the power of the devil? He tells a really good lie. And that's it. He is completely under the sovereign rule of God. Uh, That doesn't mean that he's not dangerous or rebellious. He's allowed by God to try his best as God hands him over to his rebellion. Those connected to Jesus and his victory, the first resurrection, they'll suffer, but they'll be okay. They'll be taken home, they'll be restored, they'll be on the right side of history, even beaten and bound. The devil still rallies his troops, but God's going to consign him to eternal condemnation, and that's the second death. There's your snap recap. You snap recap of everything we've just seen. Babylon is fallen. Jesus has come back. Two meals are laid. I've reminded you of everything that's come. Hey, look what's coming. Then I saw a great white throne, one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence. No place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Uh, Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Babylon has fallen. Jesus has come back. The two meals are set. God's throne comes. We've seen this throne, haven't we? Revelation 4. And so we've come a full circle. Everyone is gathered. Everyone from across history. And the judgment begins. The books are opened. And did you hear how the judgment was carried out in verse 12? Everyone is judged according to their works by what was written in the books. It's repeated again in verse 13. All humanity is judged before God and the judgment is clear. There are people at this feast and there are people at this feast. There are those who knew Jesus as their Lord and Saviour and persevered as a faithful witness and they escape the second death. And next week we will see how good their dwelling with God is. There are those who rejected Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, who persisted in rebellion against God, and they are thrown into the second death forever. Just as the imagery of the two meals posed us some questions, so too does this final recap and the clear expression of judgment day. There will be a judgment day. There will be a judgment day. Nothing is more certain than that. And so the question we are asked is how are we preparing for that day? Not waiting, how are we preparing for that day? On that day there will be a judgment from God on the basis of their works. The works that have been credited to each person's account written in the books opened before God. For those who are connected to Jesus, it is his works which are credited to them. And they spend the rest of their lives getting used to them. For those who persisted in rebelling against God, their works will be credited to them. And they will be answerable for them. Our works matter because they display who Jesus is. They don't make us part of Jesus. They display that we follow the Lamb everywhere. If Jesus is Lord, he is Lord. And he's prepared us and dressed us for that day. How are we getting ready for that day? There is great confidence for God's people, great certainty for those who trust in Jesus, great assurance of what you'll be wearing on that day. The names are already written in the book of life. The converse is also true. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that it is clear. Father, it is confusing at times because we're dealing with stuff that's of you and ripping back the curtains of the world we live in. But, Father, give us great assurance and certainty of the victory that Jesus has won once at the cross and the goodness 
of following the slaughtered lamb wherever he goes. Thank you that in grace you have provided this. In your kindness you have provided this. Thank you that we can trust your sufficiency. Our Father, as we live in this town, we pray that we will live in such a way, that we will proclaim in such a way that many others we know will come to know and love Jesus and be there at that wedding banquet. In his name we pray. Amen. Quick questions. Anyone? Pete. Yeah. Um, so if we're clothed in righteousness now, like I said, um, how does that kind of translate into the world that we don't really see it in ourselves? Hey. Yep. Yep. So what what does it look like to be clothed in what God has given us? Um, well, we're already clothed in righteousness, yep. but we still sin. So hey. I just want to see, I, I want to understand how we people see us as a witness. Is that something that's sort of just happening uh, kind of mysteriously, like in a way that we don't sort of see? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there are two things we need to be aware of that. Okay, the first is in Colossians 3, 10 to 12. People have heard me talk about this constantly, but I actually think it's a great summation of this. And Colossians 3, 10 to 12 talks about the fact that you've already been given a new set of clothes. And so you put off your old self and you put on what God has already granted you. And so there is a consistent decision daily to live with God's help, getting used to what he's already made you. Uh, we're told in 1 John chapter 2 that we'll still stumble with sin, but who we are has changed. Okay, And so daily we are putting off and putting on God already having done it, and we're getting used to what God is making. So that's one way the Bible describes it. The other way the Bible describes it is in Ephesians 6, um, and you might remember this from the series we did on Ephesians, where every day we've got to do what? We've got to suit up. Because God has given us a suit of armour that Jesus has already worn. And our battle isn't against flesh, it's against sin and the devil. And so every day in a similar type of imagery, we suit up and we make decisions enabled already by God to be what God has made us. That'll be conscious. But there'll also be moments in your life where reflectively you'll look back and go, actually, I've... God's changed me massively and he's worked through those decisions he has enabled me to make. So I think it's all of that together. So there will be some active things that people in our community will see. Hey, have you met Jesus? That's pretty active. Uh, No, I can't come to that. I've already got these commitments and that's part of the mob I'm in. And then also the way you deal with conflict and materialism and all that kind of stuff. There will also be some unconscious ways where you're not even aware of it and God will use that. So does that give you a bit of an answer? Yeah. Yeah. 